Welcome back, beautiful people, to another comic book review video where I say words about a comic that I read and you, the magically delicious, listen. It is I, your crazy Nicolas Cage, your steward of Gundor, your genius, billionaire playboy, basic YouTuber philanthropist, Supercliff. And would you kindly hit that like and subscribe button for every little bit helps in this uncanny YouTube world. And today, folks, we are covering the luminous crime fighter himself, Moon Knight, issue number one, written by Marvel's underrated writer, Jed McKay, legit. If you guys haven't read his Black Cat series, it's amazing, and you should do that immediately. And drawn by Alessandro Capacchio. And without further ado, let's get freaky. Because our story begins at night, as all Moon Knight stories should. Because, yeah, it would be pretty weird if this were to start off at some tropical beach resort in the middle of the day with the sun shining and the water glistening. <laughs> but you know what? I digress. Now, this issue picks up following Jason Aaron's Avengers story, The Age of Conchu, and we are met with Moon Knight, Mark Spector, welcoming us to his midnight mission, a place where people from around the neighborhood can come by and ask for help, help and protection from the weird and the horrible dangers whom lurk during the night. And currently the biggest issue that the people are having to deal with are vampires, because vampires have been snatching up innocents during the night, turning the people they capture into vampires, only to then send them back out to infect more people. So yeah, that's a big no-no. And, and as we're seeing this exact situation being played out, we see Moon Knight lighting down and boom, Moon Knight smashes himself against the vehicle. And after we witness the vehicles finish rolling and flipping about, the vampires fall out in process. And Moon Knight tells these bloodsuckers that he warned them. For I paint my symbol, the moon symbol, for two reasons. The first is so that people know that they are safe, safe to travel throughout the night, and two, to provide those for warning. And so since these vampires were technically warned, Moon Knight kills them both, driving a wooden stake through their hearts, turning them into charred up skeletons. Eventually, the remaining vampires, whom we saw riding in the back of the vehicle, start to crawl out from under the wreckage. And unlike the two vampires Moon Knight killed seconds prior, these freshly turned vampires are in truth not evil. In fact, they're victims, for they are the exact same people who were kidnapped and were turned into vampires. Heck, one of them even admits that before all this, they were a vegan. Therefore, Moon Knight, rather than killing these vampires, he shows them mercy and lets them go. Afterwards, we pan away from the car crash scene over to one of Moon Knight's therapy sessions with his new therapist. And Moon Knight's shown to be explaining this past event to his new therapist because is that ever since Moon Knight and the god Khonshu took over New York City in Jason Aaron's Avengers, Moon Knight, though he was forgiven, the only caveat was that Mark Spector had to see a therapist. And as their conversation continues on, they begin to talk about Mark's duty, his mission, as Mark likes to call it, the church that he started along with being a high priest for the god Khonshu. And this scene basically plays out like a recap for Mark, because as the therapist is going over the files, it's mentioned that Mark is Jewish, you know, his father was a rabbi, Mark was deemed a war criminal, and due to his experiences from the US Marines and the CIA, he ended up working with a private military contractor, whom he ended up meeting mercenary Raul Bushman, his arch nemesis. Essentially, as Mark puts it, he was a bad man who did some pretty bad things to people in foreign countries for a lot of money until the day he grew a conscious, a day when he made a stand against his fellow mercenaries. But sadly, in doing so, it cost him his life. But with his body lying at the foot of Khonshu, the Egyptian moon god brought him back to life. Thus, Moon Knight was born, the fist of Khonshu. Now, normally, this is the part where a mental health professional might be skeptical, but since her and Mark's sessions were requested by the Avengers themselves, she sees this as an opportunity to understand Mark. Plus, Mark's died a couple of times, so she begs the question to Mark, can you, Mark Spector, actually die? And Mark's response is, I don't know. Now, between their therapy sessions, Moon Knight is patrolling the neighborhood and is fighting bad guys, creatures who stalk the night. But this is also where we get a sense, recap-wise, for those new readers on how Moon Knight operates, because... Where someone like Spider-Man or Daredevil will refuse to kill, Moon Knight is not about that. Sure, he's not the Punisher, you know, he's not that extreme, but at the same time, he still doesn't mess around. 
as we saw with the vampires earlier, and as we're seeing the situation play out with the Spider-Man villain, Vermin, who seemingly possesses the power to clone himself, Moon Knight lets him know that he doesn't play games. So yeah, I'm going to kill you and every single clone of yours if your crimes continue. Because I'm not your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, I am Moon Knight, and I can't die. Afterwards, we pick back up with Mark's therapy session, and Mark is explaining to the therapist his reason, his reason for serving Conchu. Because here's the thing, folks. Though he has resurrected Mark a couple of times, Conchu's a bit of a dick, and he's not particularly a good god. And Mark, he's fully aware of this. He's aware that Conchu is unworthy of his or anyone else's worship, and that Conchu definitely deserves to be in prison within Asgard. Yet, despite all of that, Moon Knight is still at the end of the day Conchu's fist, the high priest of a god. Therefore, as a sign of respect, he's taking Conchu's duties as his own. They are now Moon Knights. Essentially, Mark is honoring his god as a sign of respect, a debt that needs to be repaid. But at the same time, he's not performing the duties that Conchu would probably like him to do. And so technically speaking, Moon Knight could actually be considered as an apostate, a heretic. And this is when we pan over to see another night where Moon Knight is chasing criminals. And at this moment, he's currently chasing down the villain known as 8-Ball. Pretty stupid, but nonetheless, he's chasing him. Now, before Moon Knight can apprehend his target, he comes across an individual, and this person seems to have already captured 8-Ball. Now, this man, he introduces himself as Dr. Badir, and he tells Moon Knight that he's actually really excited to finally meet Moon Knight face to face, but not because he's a fan, but rather because he's disappointed. Disappointed with what he sees Moon Knight doing while their god languishes in the custody of foreign deities. And so this gets Mark going, and he tells Badir that he's the Fist of Conchu, so he's pretty sure that he outranks him just by default. So, dude, like, be careful what you say, I'm in charge. But in response, Badir assures him that there is only one person who outranks him in the cult of Conchu, and Mark Spector, <laughs> bro, you are not that person. Picking up back with the therapist, we see the doctor telling Moon Knight the story about Cadman. And check it, Cadman was said to be a simple-minded person, best suited to look after the animals at the monastery. It was also said that he was ignorant to that a song, and, and because of this, it kept him out of the feasting and singing events that the other monks got to do. Until one night, he received a dream from an angel, and in this dream, the angel asked him to sing a song, to which Cadman suddenly found out that he, that he actually could. And upon waking up, he was a changed man, because Cadman can now write beautiful verses. Now, the reason she told Mark this story is because Cademan made contact with a god or something of that which defies all of logic, and that whatever contact this was, it had rewrote Cademan's brain, turning a boring person into a masterclass poet. Therefore, she's concerned about the changes Mark Spector went through following his brain-to-brain -brain contact with Conchu. Later on, we pick up at Midnight Mission, and as both him and Reese the vegan vampire who he saved in the issue's beginning are having a coffee and, you know, are just shooting the shit, talking about whatever. It's during this conversation where Mark tells Reese that it's not easy when everyone thinks you're crazy. It gets tough, especially when you're just trying to do the right thing. But because you're, quote, crazy, people take your word with a grain of salt. And he eventually tells Reese that, that the reason he thinks he gets along with her is because she, unlike so many others, doesn't try to fix him. Now, unbeknownst to them both, across the street, we see a person conveniently cloaked in shadow inside of a building where the room is filled with all sorts of military-esque spy gear. And this person is watching them, listening on their conversation. And it's made clear that whoever this person is, is offended by Moon Knight's presence, by everything that he stands for, which is why he assures us and to himself that he is willing to do whatever it takes to break Moon Knight and his faith. But wait, there's more folks, because afterwards, we pick up with Dr. Bardeer, and as he makes his way home, he goes to his statue of Conchu and begins to pray, letting his god know that he intends to correct Moon Knight. But in the meantime, Bardeer will also carry out Conchu's duty. He will keep faith, because though Conchu's right hand has failed him, his left hand won't, because Conchu's other fist still remains. Hunter's Moon remains. And that, beautiful people, was Moon Knight, issue number one. And Jed McKay does a fantastic job here with continuing Moon Knight's story from the Avengers. And he does it without making it feel as if you're missing a ton of information from previous works. Because what this book does masterfully is setting up the status quo for Moon Knight, showing and telling readers what he's all about without being too Grant Morrison. 
because this book, it doesn't depend on the reader to have read everything Moon Knight related. And so that's a big success right there. Another thing that this book does well is actually making Moon Knight somewhat sympathetic due to his mental illness. But it also does a solid job in not portraying him as some heartless killer like the Punisher. Like we actually get to see Mark being a hero. And yeah, sure, he kills vampires and whatnot. Yet at the same time, he has a code as we've seen that demonstrated with the character of Reese, Moon Knight's front desk assistant. Plus, the book contains some comedic moments as well, which is great when you're trying to help push forward a character for people to read and hopefully like. The art by Alessandro Capio was fantastic, especially during the action scenes, making those moments feel alive and explosive. And the colors by Rachel Rosenberg were also brilliant, giving us a sense that despite there being no obvious uh, supernatural powers happening, just the presence of Moon Knight himself, along with the panels featuring the statues of Khonshu, stood out the most, and because of the colors, it provided a sense of magic ever so prevalent. Plus the way in which Rosenberg was able to merge the white of Moon Knight's costume with the actual moon itself was utterly brilliant, giving us many beautiful, luminous visuals. Overall, Moon Knight issue 1 is a pretty basic first issue for the character, and although it doesn't flip the script by any means, the book's approach and telling of this character is done in a way that's definitely welcoming for new readers to jump in and get to know the superhero. Moon Knight issue number one gets an 8 out of 10. Giggity goo.